Coos fans, it's me, Candace, uh, back at you live from the bookstore for another author event. I am excited today to be talking to L.E. Madison Jr., who has written so many books. Uh, I think he has more than 70 at this point. Um, and his newest book is this one called Isolate. And he writes primarily sci-fi and fantasy, of course. Um, and his best-selling series that a lot of you probably know is The Saga of Recluse. He also wrote Imager Portfolio, a whole bunch of short stories, and just a lot of different things. And so um, today we're going to discuss this novel, Isolate. And I'm really excited uh, because he's been around for, for a long while. So I'm really excited to discuss sci-fi and fantasy with him. So Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for being with me today. Your mic is on mute again, probably accidentally, but um, yes, thank you. I'm here. <laughs> um, so t tell us a little bit about this new book. Um, just give readers a, a bit of a, because this is a whole new series. It's a whole new world. Um, so it, it's not in any of your previous uh, worlds. So tell us a little bit about this one. <laughs> well, as some of your readers may know, I spent almost 20 years in national politics in Washington, D.C. And one of the things that's always irked me over the years is very few political books really get the politics right. Hmm. And I wanted to write a fantasy that had a workable political system that was unlike anything that has ever been tried, but which I thought would work. And because it's science, because I write science fiction and fantasy, it had to have a certain fantasy element in it. So the fantasy elements are essentially, for reasons explained in the book, electricity is not possible in this world. Or I should say it's possible, but it doesn't work the way in that world as it does in ours. So the highest technology you can get to is coal fired power. So you have steamers as opposed to internal combustion engines. You have locomotives that run on coal. The fantasy element is a very tiny percentage of the population have emotional abilities. Basically, you have empaths who can read emotions, often influence emotions, and you have isolates who are, invul who are invulnerable to both. And then you have those poor benighted souls known as susceptibles. Mm -hmm. Basically ordered around by any empath. Uh, and the story takes place in the empire of gold or the kingdom of Goldor, which is and this is going to sound like almost an oxymoron in some ways to people, but it's a constitutional empire. And the imperador or the emperor has very limited but real powers. Um, and they're a little bit odd when you think about them, but they're simply there. He can dismiss the premier, um, but he can't affect any of the counselors. And the government is unicameral. There's only one legislative body, and that's the council. There are 66 counselors. And the catch to this system is the charter that set it up limits the number of members in each political party. Then there never can be less than 16, nor can there ever be more than 30. And seeing as you need to have a majority of 34, it forces compromise. And basically, the rest of the story, I mean, it's not simple, but the setup is simple. It's about a young man who, as part of his military obligation, becomes the security muscle, if you will, for a counselor whose life has been threatened. 
his partner is an empath. And basically, they're trying to keep the counselor from getting assassinated because he's the political leader of what we'd call the Labor Party, but it, it's basically, if you will, the crafters. And uh, in this system, there is, shall we say, an unholy alliance between the commercers and the landers who are the landed gentry. So that's the setup. Yeah, and what's interesting about it is that the the artisans or the like the craft party, I think is what's called in the book, is sort of on the rise in this book, but in the in the world, it's really like commerce is king in this world. Um, and the <laughs> the corporations and the counselors have basically all the power. Um and, you know, but the artisans are are sort of on the rise here. Um, and so I found that interesting, you know, uh, most all of your work makes some kind of social commentary. Um, and that is not missing here at all. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm afraid I can't get away from the social commentary. <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay. That's totally fine. Um, and so I'm wondering, like, I you you said a little bit about the the empaths and the isolates and the susceptibles, and then there's like the normal people as well. Um, and I find that it's sort of magic system, I guess, is is what it is. Uh, very interesting. So can you tell us a little bit more about like how you came up with that, like having sort of different factions of people that have different abilities. Um, and especially with empaths and isolates, because the isolates are like immune to the empaths and then the susceptibles are like extremely susceptible. So it's almost like two ends of a spectrum. Well, that, that, that's pretty much right. They are two. Yeah. They are two ends of the spectrum. But it's just really, I guess, should we say a fantasy takeoff on what exists in life? There are people who, in our world without special powers, but are, who can be extremely persuasive. An awful lot of them tend to end up in politics. Um, and there are people who pretty much run their own course and can't be persuaded by anything. I just took this a little bit further in that sense. But there's one twist that we didn't mention in this. Because of their, of their abilities, empaths are forbidden from having any um, legislative or elected role. They can be staff, but they can never hold either an elected or an appointed position in government. That is to say, they couldn't be the equivalent of cabinet officers or what have you. They can be staffers, but they can't be any higher. And because isolates cannot be influenced, most people, most organizations are very reluctant to have very many of them in their organization because nobody knows what they're thinking and nobody can find out what they're thinking. And so our two protagonists are a woman, an empath, Gisela, who is, if you will, unable to go beyond a certain level of staff, and her partner, Stefan Deckard, who is shall we say, whose prospects are somewhat limited because of who he is. And they're trying to protect a counselor who is attempting, as you noted earlier, to bring the crafters to power to undo some of the abuses of the commercers and the landers. Yeah, and he is he's a little bit the, the boss man. Well, their, their boss is a... Uh, it's sort of cool, actually. <laughs> he he like encourages like question them to question things, and he, I don't know, he's he's like he he doesn't he he doesn't want them just to like take things at face value. Like he really wants them to like investigate and stuff. And you don't see bosses like that very often. I wish I'd had more bosses like that in my life. <laughs> I've had one or two like that, and that's who those are, those are the ones on whom. Obrador's man is modeled. But I nice. have to say, they're even rarer in our world than they are in this world. Yeah, so this I agree. <laughs> or the fantasy world I've written. Yeah, I totally agree. And so tell us a little bit more about your two main characters and um, and where they came from, I guess, where your inspiration for them. <laughs> 
Well, I'd have to say that Stefan and I have a lot in common. And I'm just going to leave it at that. All right. <laughs> uh, as far as Gisela, I'm not sure. There are so many. Well, I guess it's, I'll put it in a different way. I've been very fortunate in my life to be surrounded by strong and brilliant women. And I can't tell, tell you which part of whom or where all the pieces came from, but all of her characteristics come from the various strong and brilliant women that I have known. Um, and uh, well, let's put it this way. I do have five daughters. <laughs> <laughs> awesome and this is them on the cover i assume this is this is them so if y'all oh, want to um, sort of yes yes yesella is uh obviously the one with the slightly longer hair but they're both in uniform yeah um, the other thing about it is and it, it, i don't make a big deal about it but there is a reverse coloration in this book in the sense that in essence while well, nobody's black skinned, those who who have a darker Latin skin tend to be higher in the social hierarchy. And the lowest in the social, social hierarchy are people who are very fair, fair skinned because they can because they're fair skinned, they they can take the sun. Yep. Yep. And um and yeah, I find your your world building really interesting. In this too, it's it's a totally new world. We have a, a, a like you, you can describe the political system a little bit already, um, and so there's all of that. Plus, there's the the sort of magical side with the empaths and the isolates, and it, there's just like a lot going on in this world, and it feels very real. So I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your world building process when you're building new worlds, and kind of what how how I guess you go about building these worlds and what you want readers to, to sort of take from it. I guess my biggest rule in terms of world building is I try to make everything fit together and make sense. Um, and I suppose it helps that I've had a, shall we say, a very checkered background in terms of the jobs I've held, the positions I've been in, and what have you. But there are all, I mean, I was trained as an economist all, <clears throat> way back in the dark ages. And one <laughs> of the things is that everything's got to have a cost. Everything's got to, you have to have a way for things to be paid for. The economics have to work. Um, and basically, I just try and make all of those pieces fit together, um, both economically and socially. Um And how do you like keep track of all of it? Do you just like write everything down? Do you have like a, I don't know, a world building Bible, I guess, or like somewhere where you kind of keep track of everything? Actually, or is it just all in your head? <laughs> most of it's in my head. Yeah. I mean, the things I have to write down are not so much the world as the names of minor characters. <laughs> um, That's fair. And you know, occasionally notes on things that I, I'm afraid that I might forget. But my stack of notes is fairly small, but I do have them. Um, I do keep a running chronology of the chapters and the dates in the local calendar of each chapter. That makes sense because timeline stuff too um you know just just keeping keeping track of it all so i you know it makes sense that you would have like okay this is what happens when <laughs> I just that's what happens it's just basically it'll, it'll say chapter one it'll give the date and you know whichever whichever day it is i don't put the year in except at the end of the year because none of these books uh, including the ones that are, aren't out yet. None of them take more than a year or a year and a half, depending on the way the seasons fall. Yeah. And 
And I, I have a somewhat different calendar. I mean, in this particular book, the weeks are only six days long. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um, <clears throat> people tend to take off, if you will, the fifth day or part of the fifth day. And then six days or end day is our equivalent of the weekend. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, it makes sense because they're, since they're not on the same sort of calendar as we are, <laughs> that you would, that you would keep track of that a little bit. And my other question as far as world building is why did you decide to do this in like a steampunky kind of a world um, where, like you said earlier, it's, you know, the, the highest technology is the coal um, stuff. Actually, I never thought of it as steampunk. Um, I just basically wanted to see what you could do with this if you couldn't have electricity. How far could you go with the culture? What could mm -hmm. you do? I had to do a fair amount of research on that, actually, to find out which technologies, and there's some sophisticated technologies in this world. I mean, can you, for example, have plate glass without electricity? Yes, you can. I discovered that. <laughs> and yes, um, there's not very much aluminum because it's really hard to do aluminum. It can be done, but it's almost impossible to forge aluminum without massive use of electricity. So there's not much aluminum. It's a rare metal, which it was in our world until people discovered that you could do things with electricity. Um, that sort of thing. I mean, basically, I literally had each industrial process, and there are many of them that Deckard encounters, each industrial process that I came up with can be done without electricity. I didn't fudge that in the slightest. Yeah, and then, and then also because of you know, that, that everything mainly runs on coal, there's like coal shortages and there's trade deficits and there's like a search for alternative power sources. And it sort of adds all of that additional there's also, um, detail in there. There's also brown clouds. There's mm -hmm. also rains which drop brownish sludge in certain cities. Yep. And, um, and yeah, and there was a, a fact in there that I found really interesting as well, where tulip petals are a substitute for onions and that's like a real thing which i had no idea about uh, <laughs> so i just thought that was pretty cool that I was like oh you can you can actually like in real life you can substitute tulip petals for onions if you really want to uh and i just thought that was that was sort of cool did you like know that fact or is that something you discovered in your research too i don't know whether i knew it or i rediscovered it frankly <laughs> I mean, a lot of men, this is going to sound like a digression, but I'll get to the end of it pretty quick. Sure. A lot of men are toy boys. They love their toys. They love their cars. They may mm -hmm. like, like, mini like miniature trains. My kids hate to think about getting me gifts because I don't do any of those things. I collect information. Um the postman groans because I don't like to do it electronically when he, every day that they come to our house because there's usually a stack of periodicals in it. And like I said, I collect information. I've got two or three history magazines, a bunch of science magazines, etc. Of course, a bunch of economic publications too. <laughs> and that's what I collect. And that's, I think that's super cool. I, I love, I mean, I guess being a bookstore owner, I also love information. <laughs> I like, uh, I've always been interested in, in collecting information as well. So I think that that's pretty cool. Um, now, of course, me, most of my information that I collect nowadays is electronic, although I do have tons and tons of books <laughs> and they're not light <laughs> to carry around. <laughs> Um, and so tell us a little bit about like when you create these new worlds, what comes first for you? Is it typically like the world comes first? Is it the characters? Is it the story? Like what, 
what typically comes to you first? I think probably the general structure of the of the world comes first. I mean, basically, I wanted a fantasy and a coal-fired thing that wasn't steampunk, um, which is why it's being marketed as gas lamp fantasy because yeah. it's really not steampunk. Yes, it's steam powered, but it's not steampunk. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But then the general idea of the main characters, the problems that they're going to face. And um, that's sort of where I start. Um, oh, yes. And also, there's always a map. Now, this one yeah. doesn't. This one doesn't have a map. In I was going to say, I don't think that this one has a map inside of it, does it? You don't need a map for this one. But yeah. I need a map because I've got counselors from different districts all across the empire. And I need to know where they are from. And in a steam-powered society, I need to know how long it's going to take them to get on the train to get back to the capital, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I do have a fairly detailed map. What I do like is that, it, even though it doesn't have a map, it does have this list of major characters at the very beginning. And I really, I like that because there's, you know, it's it's a big world. There's a lot of people to keep up with. <laughs> so yeah. I, I love it when books do that. It's like, oh, like, let me go back. Oh, okay, this is who this person is. <laughs> uh, it's, I, I, I like that a lot. Um, and so who was your favorite character to write? Do you have a favorite one for this book? Um, I'd say, I, that's gonna sound odd, but I'd say co-favorites. I mean, okay. I, I like the two protagonists and I liked writing the interplay with them. Um, a, a lot of times some readers get a little irritated because the romance in my books is what has often been, and even the plot has often been characterized as slow burn. Mm -hmm. um, but, and it's going to sound funny for a lot of reasons, especially people who know me, but most people's relationships or many people's relationships aren't instantaneous decision. Sure. And in my own case, it's ironic. I've been married three times. I knew my first wife for almost 10 years before we were married. And that didn't work out. I knew my second wife for three years before we were married. And that didn't work out. I met my third wife and proposed to her within two months. And we've been married 30 years. So that's ironic <laughs> when I, I write slow burn, but the other thing about this is that with those two characters and the culture they're in, it's an extreme, I mean, a couple of reviews, reader reviews have come in and said, this is awfully formal and tight. That's because this culture is formal and tight. And in, in rural and culture-bound societies, relationships do not, or often do not, are not allowed to develop really quickly. And I will give a hint of a spoiler here. There is a very good reason why Yasala does not want to get involved with Stefan Deckard unless she knows a great deal more about him. And it's not a quibble. It's a very real reason. But I'm not going to say what it is. No. <laughs> um, but it does, you know, you know, it, it's very interesting, too, with, with the empaths and the isolates, because I think, you know, a, a re relationships are interesting because, you know, empaths can't affect isolates at all. Um, and, you know, isolates, you know, it's kind of like they just... It, it's hard for them in a lot of ways um, because they're so used to being one way, you know, an isolate just isn't affected. And so it's like, 
whatever <laughs> empaths are so used to affecting other people in certain ways and they can't affect isolates in that way. And I just find that really, it, it makes for really interesting relationships. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Not trying to make any spoilers, but it does make for interesting relationships. Well, I mean, there, there's, um, a, there's, a, there's an old statement of old joke about how do porcupines make love? Very carefully. <laughs> right. Well, in that sense, both Yasella and Deckard are both porcupines. Yes, they do. They both have to be very careful. This is true. Um, and let's talk a little bit, too, about the. there's sort of a mystery element in this book, um, because that is like the premise is that uh, these higher level folks, and it's not just their boss, it's like some other people, other important people are being attacked in different ways as well. And Stefan is investigating and trying to link these events together and trying to figure out, you know, who's going after them and all of that. So how did you keep track of like all of the elements to the the mystery here? Um, because I, I'm always curious as to as to how authors do that with uh, with mystery elements. With great difficulty. <laughs> um, I think basically it helps. There's actually an underlying, shall we say, structure behind it all. And it helps to have that because while there are random acts of violence in a society, most, shall we say, villainy, has got a structure behind it of some sort. Mm -hmm. And I just try and keep track of that structure and make sure whatever nefarious stuff is going on fits in with the motivations of those who have the structure. Um, and a lot of times I'd have to go back and rewrite stuff because I'd simply think, uh-uh, that doesn't fit with their, shall we say, their approach and their belief. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and, and something that I found really interesting is that um, I, I really like how you used this investigation um, and, and Stefan's sort of asking things and, you know, just the investigation as a whole to reveal the world. So there aren't any like lengthy exposition stuff in the book. Um, you, it's sort of just revealed as we go along and, and through the investigation, you find out more and more and more about the world. And I thought it was really cool how, how you did that. That's more of a comment than a question. <laughs> I, just, I, yeah. I, I, I like that there wasn't any like super lengthy expositions, but you still got all of this information. Well, that's what, that's what I try, try to do, obviously. Um, yeah. But the but I guess the thing that goes with it is, for me, that's what makes a book successful, that the pieces fit together without having, and there are one or two pieces I had to stretch a little bit because my editor wanted something in there, and I'm not going to tell you what it is, but wanted something in there that she felt was really necessary, and I really had to work to find a way to slip it in there. But when I did do it, people don't even notice what it, it fit so seamlessly, but it was, it was a bit of a struggle. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, I, I also want to talk a little bit more sort of generally because you've, you've been around for like a really long time. You've written a lot of books. Um, and so what, like, what was, what was science fiction and fantasy like when you were first getting started as a writer? And like, how do you think it's evolved since, since you're, you know, over the course of your career well, as a genre? <laughs> I'll start out with something that a lot of people know, but I'm not sure you do. And okay. That, I never set out to write science fiction. I was trained as a classical poet. Oh, I didn't know that. That's cool. Um, and that was my literary background in college. And I knew poets did not make a living. So I had a double major in economics and political science, uh, which served me quite well late in later life. 
But I wrote poetry from the time I was about 15 until I was close to 30. Never got any further than the small literary magazines. And uh, I'd read science fiction ever since I was about 12 or 13. And somebody said to me when I was about 28 or 29, your poetry is not going anyplace. And that was pretty obvious. Um, and um, why don't you write a science fiction story? So I did. And um, it got rejected. But I got a rejection letter from Ben Bova that basically said, this isn't bad. If you can rewrite the mess you made out of page 13, I'll look at it again. And I did. And he bought it. And I said, yeah, I'm a writer. No. Over the next six years, I wrote over 100 stories and I sold six. Um, the last rejection letter I got from Ben Bova was, don't send me any of my stories. I won't buy them. You're a novelist. Go write a novel. And I did. And uh, I sold it as my 78th published novel. Now, getting back to your question, which is what it was like. All right, item number one, back when I started, you could literally submit a novel over the transom, as they said. I didn't know anybody in the field when I started out. Um, I'd never been to a convention, but I just sent in stories to the magazines. And while most of them got rejected, some of them got published. And uh, I did the same thing when I started writing novels. Um, and I was going to sell that first novel to Ben Bova and have it serialized by analog. But Ben Bova left being editor there, and Stan Schmidt wasn't interested. So I had to basically go start from scratch there and submit it. But based, I didn't have an agent, um, and I still don't. Uh, basically, I, I submitted initially um, to... Uh, well, my first editor finally was David Hartwell, who was then at the head editor at, at uh, Timescape. And um, he bought the first book. And uh, right after it was published, Simon & Schuster abolished the Timescape label, and I had to find another publisher. And that was Avon. And right after they published that, Avon froze submissions for five years because they had too big a backlist. So I had to find another publisher, except my first editor turned up in this little outfit, startup outfit called Tor, and they were the only one who was interested in my stuff back then. And I've been with Tor for over 30 years. But the field was very different back then. It was, it was both more open and more closed simultaneously. It was a lot easier for somebody who was unknown I think, if you had talent to break in. Um, the computer, and this is going to sound odd, changed that. Sure. Because now anybody can put together something that looks like a novel, is formatted correctly, and it just inundated the publishing field. And probably by, I would say, somewhere in the late, 90s or the early 2000s, it got to the point where, for the most part, unless you had a personal contact, um, met somebody at a convention, persuaded an editor at a, at a big house to uh, take a look at your book, the agents have become pretty much the gatekeepers in traditional publications, or, or as the indies call it, trad pub. Um, then, say, roughly around 2015, you had the great indie revolution where people now, there was publishing software, people could get published by the, on their own, and it's a mad scramble among the ind independents to see if they can get market share. I'm really glad I, did, I am not starting in this market today, I have to say. Is that sort of an answer to your question? No, oh, yeah, that was a great answer. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can imagine how much harder it is because you know, or or how interesting it must have been to sort of see, 
to see it evolve there because, you know, I'm sure the computer really did. I mean, you know, get publishers started getting more and more stuff <laughs> because the computer and then the internet and then all of that, you know, it's like the, the publishers now, like just anybody can write anything and just zoom it over, <laughs> you know, um, versus, you know, where you had to like actually mail things in and uh i guess it's made it a lot easier and so there's just more people trying to do it well i mean when i wrote my first novel computers were not unless you were a computer engineer yourself they simply were not very user friendly and so i wrote my first few books on an electric typewriter it was a great deal when i got to an electric typewriter with spell check on it but still, when you have to type out every page, you're either going to need a lot of whiteout or you're going to re be retyping a whole lot of pages. Um, that's a lot of physical effort. And I think it basically winnowed out a lot of people who just, well, I've got this idea, but I just don't know. And I mean, that was one of the reasons going back in history a little bit, but that was one of the reasons why I was, when I was first writing and selling stories, I didn't want to write a novel because <clears throat> at that point, at the end, I was maybe selling one in five stories. Back then, a novel was 90,000 words. Um, and I was thinking, I might have to write five books to sell one, and that's a half million words. Uh, and a half million words on an electric typewriter is brutal. But then Ben Bovo, who was the only one who was really re reliably buying my short stories said he wasn't going to buy any. I sort of got forced into writing that first novel. Yeah. I mean, that's a really good point that it just, it took a whole lot more effort pre-computer to actually write a book. Um, you know, I mean, I guess people can write it out, but like you would have to type it in order to submit it anywhere. So, um, or, or did, I assume people didn't take written, submissions um but they did through the 50s i don't know how much past that they did and only generally with well with authors already been established now there's no way i was going to ever going to be able to submit anything um handwritten my handwriting is pretty much indecipherable even when i'm if i'm signing books i will print because you couldn't read my handwriting um uh, I started writing with a typewriter when I was about 15 because I'd get things back from the teachers saying, I can't read this. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and so let's, let's like jump to today. What do you think about sort of the state, I guess, of science fiction and fantasy today? And where do you think we're, we're headed um, as a genre? All right. I'll start this out with the most honest answer. Yeah. I don't have the faintest idea. Sure. Now I'll speculate <laughs> on it. Um, one of the problems with science fiction, and I'll start there, is one, it's gotten incredibly more complex. Um, my last pure science fiction novel, it's about four or five years back, it's called Solar Express. And it was actually a book Tom Doherty asked me to write in a general sense. He wanted me to write a science fiction book that NASA would like. And NASA did like it, as a matter of fact. Um, but it's called Solar Express. And it took, took me about twice as long to write that book as anything I've ever, as I've written. And I've got a fairly knowledgeable science background, but to do it the right way, took a tremendous amount of research um, to do it. And as I said, I'm pretty knowledgeable in a lot of that stuff, but it takes a tremendous amount of effort. And with the internet, the number of people who can quibble and raise difficulties over an author's mistakes has grown also exponentially. So, a writer who's writing science fiction not only has to deal with a much broader base, but it has also got to deal with a much broader base of critics. 
So science fiction has become extremely difficult to write both well in a way that's accepted. Um, and I don't think that's going to change. The other thing is that as we know more, a lot of the earlier, shall we say, myths or suspositions have gone by the wayside. Um, I mean, right now, science fiction is, in essence, pretty much expect, accepted a hand wavium approach to faster than light travel. <clears throat> I mean, theoretically, there is a way to do faster than light travel if you can master a hawking wormhole. But the problem with that is that the power to do that would take pretty much the equivalent of a small black hole. And this is technically rather difficult and in terms of energy consumption, totally impractical. So everybody just pretends that we can have interstellar travel in science fiction uh, or <clears throat> the deal, deal with interplanetary stuff. But that limits to a certain degree the horizons, which is an, I think another reason why fantasy has expanded. Um, I would say in a lot of ways, it's maybe the golden age of fantasy. I've seen a tremendous amount more of innovative stuff. I've seen a tremendous amount of duplication, um, but there are an awful lot of gems among, among the, among the uh, duplicated masses, so to speak. Anyway, that's no, yeah, that. I totally agree. I think, um, you know, Wheel of Time is is big right now because the TV show has come out. Um, and so a lot of people are talking about Wheel of Time. And I, I have not read the books for Wheel of Time. I will admit that um, they I, I, I never I just never read them as a kid for some reason. And then I don't know, I just didn't read, haven't read them. Um, and a lot of people are talking about that. And I think that it's, you know, a lot of a lot of fantasy, especially after Tolkien, sort of wanted to replicate Tolkien and Wheel of Time is one of those where and it gets compared to Lord of the Rings a lot where it's like, OK, you know, you you have the like epic hero's journey stuff and like a lot of fantasy is like that. But I totally agree that, you know, within the past five years or so, there's been so much that is like really different and really innovative and really cool. And I think the the genre is doing some really interesting stuff um, and, and innovative stuff. And I think a lot of the times people get stuck in like, oh, this is this is fantasy and this is what all of it is, thinking the Lord of the Rings type thing. And it's like, oh, man, no, read some newer stuff. <laughs> like it's, not, it's not all like that anymore. <laughs> and I think that's really cool. Well, um, that's one of the things that I did with the Recluse Saga. I just simply did not want to do the kind of fantasy that anybody else was doing. And there aren't many, there are not many extended series like Recluse out there. Mm -mm. Yeah. And I, you know, and I just think it's always cool when people do different things. Um, and, and I think that's why I like sci-fi and fantasy so much as a genre um, because it really is because it's speculative, right? Because we can, we can imagine new worlds. We can imagine better worlds. Um, I know a lot. A lot of sci-fi these days is dystopia <laughs> and depressing stuff. But also, uh, you know, we can imagine like really great worlds and and different, you know, different ways of doing things. And I think that's really important for the world in general. Well, I've always I've always felt that way. Even in my grimmest books, there is always at least a glimmer of hope. Mm -hmm the end um i mean i know some writers who shall remain nameless who are technically very good writers but i can't stand their stuff because it's so damn depressing yeah. i mean i can say my god the verbal technique here is wonderful but i don't i don't want to spend that much time with these bastards yeah, it's so true. I feel like that about quite a few books as well. And, and certain authors who who is just like, oh, man, this is just relentless. I don't want I don't want that. 
I want something that's like at least has some sort of like you're saying some sort of hope even if it's like I like dark stuff but I want there to be like a glimmer of hope in it um because you know if it's just super dark and depressing then that's you know I'm just like no I don't read for that I don't read for that I don't want that in my books or in my uh tv shows or my movies like I don't I don't watch for that kind of stuff <laughs> some people really like it but that not me I I'm I want to escape into something that's cool and different and at least gives me hope in some sort of way at the end. Um, and, and I think what's also really cool about your body of work is that in pretty much all of it or in all of it that I know of you, um, you explore the like ethical issues, right? And you have like all this stuff about society and you have all these things about ethics and like, like most of your stuff now, and you're pretty well known for that, for like exploring ethical issues in your work. Um, well, it's, yeah, it's pretty much the exploration of the intersection of power and ethics. The, expo- the intersection of, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part. Power and oh, ethics. power and ethics. Yes, exactly. And that's pretty much like most of your, most of your work, um, like has that theme in there. Um, and so I was just wondering, and, and including this one, this one's not any different from that either. And so I'm just wondering what makes that a recurring theme for you? Like, why do you like exploring that so much? 20 years in politics. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> um, there are different kinds of power. And I've tried to explore a lot of them in different ways in my books. But Politics is, in essence, what you do in a society to apply power. What you do to apply power. That's simply it. And it can range from dictatorship and autocracy to close to anarchy. I don't like either extreme, but I've written close to the extremes on each end although I tend to stay a little bit more in the middle. I mean, I I, I was going to say, to me, the greatest evil in any society is extremism. Whether it's extremism of the left, extremism of the right, extremism of free expression, you name it, you get to the extremes and it's indistinguishable from pure evil. And yeah, and so like, and yeah, and you explore that a lot, I guess, in your in your work, um, just in general with like, you know, ethics of a person, you know, like individual sort of ethics, and then also ethics of the larger society, ethics of governments, ethics of you know politics, um, and I, and I find it really interesting that you know how how those things differ, right? Like your your one person's ethics. Um, are very different from, you know, <laughs> the greater ethics uh, and sort of how how that works together. And this book does that a little bit more too because because it's so political um, that it's it really gets into that. Um, I, I guess it just really gets into that with the with the politics and the power and, and ethics and like what does it all mean? <laughs> well, there are two more books to come. Yeah. <laughs> And um, and and you were telling me before this that you're you're finished writing. So this will be a trilogy, and you're finished it, right? As far as your actual first as draft, like writings go. Yes, these three books are. <clears throat> and, and I mean, actually, even counselors, pretty much all the way through the production process, <clears throat> it'll be out in August. Nice. Assuming, assuming, assuming it's not a casualty of the supply chain, but. <laughs> And uh, so when you were planning the trilogy, did you plan the whole story arc of the whole trilogy? Um, or do you do it book by book? Like, how do you how do you do that? I have a general idea of the whole arc, but I don't have all of the details. I know where the character is going to start. I know about where the character is going to end. Um, and sometimes it changes a little bit. I mean, in this... I have to say in this one where Deckard ends up in the third book, it's not exactly where I thought he would end up, 
but it makes more sense. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I'm always, I'm just always interested in authors, uh, planning processes, I guess, when it's a series um, versus a standalone, because sometimes authors are like, I didn't even know this was going to be a series. I just wrote the first book <laughs> like, and then turned into a series. <laughs> Actually, that happened to me with Recluse. Oh, did it? I wrote the first book as a challenge <clears throat> because way in the distant past, I made some comments about the lack of understanding of economics and politics about fantasy authors. And um, I got a lot of heat for it. And I said, yeah, I can write a fantasy that has, that's logical, that has realistic economics, realistic social structures and appropriate technology, and it can still be a fantasy. And so I wrote the, I wrote the Magic of Reckless. I didn't even tell my editor I was writing it. I just sent it to him. And, his re and David's reaction was, you did what? Because I'd been writing science fiction for 20 years. And that at that point, that was what I was known for. These days, a lot of people don't even know that I write science fiction. It's all fantasy is what I'm known for. But at that time, I hadn't written any fantasy. And uh, so that was supposed to be a one-off. That was 23 books ago. That's so interesting. And that was another question I had for you because you've you've written both science fiction and fantasy. And I'm wondering if you prefer one over the other. Not really. Um, you do you can do different things in each genre. And I like doing different things. Um, it's getting harder, at least for me to write really good science fiction. Um, and when I write it, a lot of people don't like it as well as the fantasy. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I like, I mean, I like both for different reasons when I, as a reader, um, you know, I, it just kind of depends on my mood for the day, I guess, um, what, what I want to look at. Uh, and, and I'm also wondering if your writing process has changed at all over the years or like how, how ha has your writing process evolved or not? Like, do you still sort of have a similar process as to what you did at the beginning or has it changed and evolved? Um, it's evolved some, but <clears throat> not, well... We have to put this in perspective. I didn't write my first science fiction story even until I was almost 30. Now I had spent almost 15 years before that writing all sorts of other things. I wrote speeches, I wrote technical documents. So I had 15 to 20 years of writing experience before I ever really got into writing science fiction and fantasy. So probably my writing process won't has changed less than a lot of writers would over over the over the early part of a career because I had a lot of experience and I made a lot of mistakes in, in those hundred science fiction stories. Uh, so but people don't see that as much. Um, as far as since I began writing novels, it's changed a little bit, but not much. Um, when I first started writing, and part of this was out of necessity, before the computer, I had this big accordion file and I'd write sections and I'd put sections where I thought they were gonna be and then I'd fit it together as I went along. Well, until the 286 processor came in, you couldn't do that with the computer. There wasn't storage enough. However, once there was a 286 computer, I immediately went to the computer. Um, and I did that in a certain way electronically. Now, in terms of changing, I don't write as much out of sequence now as I once did, because I probably have a better idea of where stuff is going, or at least a better feel for where stuff is going. But I still will write some of it out of sequence, because one, I don't want to forget something if I've got a really good idea or a good thought for the future part of the book. But I don't write as much out of sequence as I did then. Um, and, um, 
I'd say that's probably the biggest change. Yeah, that's really, it's just really cool for, for me to hear that, you know, hear, hear how things have changed or not. Um, because I, you know, I can imagine that you've, you've gotten more, I don't know, efficient or better. Like you've written so many books that you would think that like uh, that much practice. <laughs> that, well, um, that That's a two-edged sword because I have a personal rule, which is try not to repeat anything. Oh goodness. Yeah. Well, when you've written, well, I've actually written 80 books. The last two haven't been published yet, but, and I'm working on 81, but I try and do different things. I mean, I have written books from the first person present tense, the first person past tense, the third person past tense, the third person present tense. I've had female and male protagonists um, and science fiction and fantasy. Um, and I try to try, I try to do different things. I mean, I, well, <clears throat> the grand illusion, the three books of the isolate, and there may be a fourth book. I'm thinking about that, but, um, that was, a, that was another challenge challenge that I wanted to see what I could do with that kind of a setting. Um, and that the, the the should we say emotional permut, permutations of that kind of a society and because you written because i've written so many books it gets a little harder each time to say okay what haven't i done and what can i twist right i bet it does <laughs> so technically i can probably write a little bit better and more smoothly, but dealing with what I'm writing has gotten harder. Sure. And, um, and yeah, so what's next for you? I mean, I know you said that the, you have, we have two more books to look forward to, at maybe, maybe three more, <laughs> depending. Um, but definitely two, but uh, is there anything else that you're working on that you want to, that you can tell us about, I guess? Well, all right. First, Counselor, the second book in, the Grand Illusion will be out next August. The third book, Contrarian, is scheduled for roughly for mid-2023. <clears throat> and I am working on another recluse novel, which will probably be at least a duology. Um, and I'm maybe 70% through with it. Okay, cool. So we still, you're, you're just, you're continuing to pump them out. <laughs> I don't know about pumping, but I'm continuing to work on them. <laughs> Once a year seems, seems to, seems to be pretty, pretty good. I, I think, uh, considering some, some other authors take years in between books. So <laughs> once a year is pumping them out to me. <laughs> well, right. I'm averaging about one and a half a year right now which is still pretty good, I think. Um, and so what are you currently reading? Do you have any book recommendations that uh, you think people might like? Actually, because of the COVID stuff, I have read almost no fiction in the last six months. Doesn't mean I don't read, but most of my reading has been things like Scientific American, History Magazine, um, I take a couple of archaeological magazines. Um, awesome. Do you have any then like fun facts that you've learned from the stuff that you've read? Well, I mean, for the for over the years, the funnest fact I have is the Anakathera device. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but this is mm -hmm. a bronze computer that was found about 100 years ago in the Aegean. And they have finally, with the use of MRIs, reconstructed what it did. And basically, it was a gear-driven device that predicted the motions of the five planets, calculated the next solar and lunar eclipses, and actually had a wheel for calculating when the next four-year cycle on the Greek Olympics would be. There was nothing that sophisticated 
built anywhere in the world until the 15 or 1600s. Um, and initially when they found this lump of bronze, nobody could figure out what it was. But thankfully they didn't do anything with it. Uh, and then, I don't know, probably 20, 30 years ago, maybe longer ago, part of it fell off and they saw, they saw the gears inside or what was left of the gears and they thought, hmm, but still nobody could do anything about it. And then in the last three or four years with image, imaging devices and um, various scanning things, they've actually figured out and they've actually calculated and they've built a, di a digital replica of the thing. And it actually works and it matches the inscriptions and the directions on the original. That's the funnest fact that I, that I can come up with. That's uh, really cool. What's it called again? The Antikythera device. Okay. The Antikythera. It's named after the an island of Antith Antikythera, which is where it was found by sponge divers, as I recall, in a Greek shipwreck. Um, but there are a lot of articles on it, have been a lot of articles on it recently. Cool. I'm going to look it up because that sounds really cool. <laughs> I love uh, anthropology, too. It's so interesting to me just to, you know, when they dig up all these kinds of things, um, because it's just it tells us so much about just our history in the world and like what people were doing. And it, it's always surprising. Um, and it's it's just super interesting to me. Well, on the feminist side, there's one other interesting thing that I've discovered. Sure. Recently, they've discovered that in analysis that some of the Scythian warriors they found that they thought were men were women. That's cool. Um, and apparently in certain tribes, women were actually, even back then, powerful and accorded, accorded responsibility. I mean, a lot of them were buried with weapons that had been clearly used. Yeah, and that's, you know, I love this kind of stuff. It's so, it's so cool. Um, well, I think we're we're about out of time. Uh, this, this conversation has been so fascinating. Thank you so much for talking to me. And well, I'm going to tell people, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, thank you for having me. Oh, yes. And I'm going to tell people to buy this book, uh, Isolate, and I'll show you all the... Um, the cover i have it right here uh it's very very cool um i i like the vibe of the cover i think it uh captures the vibe of the book pretty well um so so yes isolate is the first novel in the grand illusion series uh it's a brand new series um so pick it up and all three books are already written see this is what i like about series i I don't like reading them unless I know that the books are coming out, you know, because it's like sometimes you read a book and then it's like, oh, we don't know when the next one's coming. And like, I, I can't. So the good thing about this series is that three books are written already <laughs> um, and the next one is getting published next year. Um, and so like they'll, they're coming out. So um, so definitely get get the book, buy the book. Um, and you can do that if you go to our website, tubbyandcoos.com, uh, and click on place an order, um, or you can go here, tubbyandcoos.com slash special order, um, and, and order the book. And thanks again, um, for talking to me. I, I, I love talking about just, um, the, the book and the history stuff and, and all of that. So I really appreciate your time. Oh, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> and uh and we'll see everyone next time for our next author event have a good night everybody <laughs>